Thank you all very much for joining us today. Our speaker is Mark Egan, who is the Kingdon Professor, Associate Professor of Business Administration at Harvard and the Finance Unit in the Harvard Business School. Uh, his webpage says that he works on the intersection of corporate finance and industrial organization, but um, I, I, from what uh, of his work that I know, it seems like a lot of it's actually related to the sort of intersection between corporate finance and personnel economics, that he's, he's interested in contract design and how um, the, the incentives that, that the contract design uh, creates for uh, people in the finance industry. And that's the topic of uh, today's paper. He has a, a really interesting, important paper called When Harry Fired Sally that's in the forthcoming in the Journal of Political Economy about sort of discrimination issues in the finance industry. Um, uh, but today he's going to be talking to us about how incentives shape broker behavior in variable annuities. Um, before I ask you to join me in welcoming, I just want to point out that next uh, session will be two weeks from today, and Mark Pauly from uh, UPenn's Wharton School will be talking about positive externalities in homeowners insurance and against uh, forest fires in California. With that, thank you very much, Mark, for coming, and the floor is yours. So if you have questions, you can always um, either chat them to me or raise your hand. I hope, hope that will work, but uh, chat, chat will always work. Mark. Great. Thank you very much for having me. Okay. Excited to be here. All right, let me share my screen. All right. So today I'm going to talk about a couple of different projects I've worked on and mainly focusing on uh, the paper that was posted on looking at conflicts of interest in the variable annuity market. So to give you some motivation, uh, we're looking at generally in this research agenda is looking at how retail consumers, and when I say retail consumers, I'm thinking everyday households, how do they make investment decisions? What we see in the data, there's large dispersion uh, in the prices of seemingly ident identical financial products. Uh, if you look in the data, most Americans report seeking help from financial professionals. But one concern we have in the industry, or we potentially have concerns, is that brokers in the U.S. are not held to a fiduciary duty. So this means they're not obligated to look out to your, for your, their clients' best financial interests. They're held to a lower suitability standard, which means they have to sell products that are suitable for their consumers, which basically means you can't sell uh, risky products to retirees. So the key point is financial advisors or brokers play a critical, critical role in markets with information frictions, uh, like financial products, and the incentives of those intermediaries may not align with those of their uh, customers or consumers. To give you more context, this is something that's been talked a lot about a lot over the past 20 years. So this is SEC or former SEC chairman Mary Shapiro. I've long advocated for a uniform fiduciary standard, and I'm pleased that uh, the legislation, so she's referring to the Dodd-Frank Act, would provide us with rulemaking authority necessary to implement it. And then this is from President Obama in 2015. It's a very simple principle. You want to give financial advice, you've got to put your client's interests first. So the Dodd-Frank Act empowered the SEC to hold brokers to fiduciary duty. Uh, in 2016, the Department of Labor issued their fiduciary rule, which required brokers to act in their clients' best interests when selling retirement products. Uh, though I'll talk about in a little bit, the rule actually never ended up being uh, enforced and was eventually withdrawn. The other thing I'll talk a little bit about today is even ignoring the sort of fiduciary issue, there's just been long concerns about the quality of advice in the financial services industry. Uh, for example, 48% of Americans think that finance actually hurts the economy, where only 34% thinks it helps. And the financial industry is consistently ranked among the lowest uh, when consumers are asked on what industries they trust to do the right thing. Uh, and another paper I'll, I'll talk about a little bit briefly today, we find that roughly one in 13 financial advisors have a past record of misconduct. And when I say misconduct, you should think things like fraud and forgery, not selling high fee products. Selling high fee products wouldn't show up as misconduct. Um, you should think, yeah, like things like fraud and forgery. And what we also find is it varies geographically. So even though it's one in 13 financial advisors on average have a past record of misconduct, it's closer to one in five or one in four advisors in West Palm Beach, Florida have a record of misconduct. Conversely, if you were to go in the Boston area, it's closer to one in 20 advisors have a past record of misconduct. Uh, and it varies quite a bit across firms. So at Oppenheimer, it's a large firm in the US, one in five, and actually 
if you I think were a bit more accurate in your calculations, it'd be closer to one in three advisors uh, at Oppenheimer have a past record of misconduct. Where if you go to USA Advisors, they service military families. It's closer to like one in a hundred of their advisors has a past record of misconduct. So I want to give some more context. So I've been saying this: financial advisors, brokers, and just give you a little bit, be a little bit more concrete about what I actually mean, because uh, it can be a little tricky and uh, to understand some of these differences. So I've been saying financial advisor, and financial advisor actually is not a legal term. What financial advisor typically means to is a broker. So what happened about 20 years ago, the term broker sort of fell out of fashion and they was sort of rebranded as financial advisors. So when I say financial advisors, what I really mean is brokers. These are people who are registered with FINRA. They're held to a suitability standard, not a fiduciary standard. Uh, and what they do is they charge fees for making trades on behalf of their clients. What's slightly different is we also have SEC registered investment advisors or investment advisor representatives these individuals are registered with the SEC. They provide financial advice to consumers. And what's different is these SEC registered investment advisors or investment advisor representatives are held to a fiduciary standard when giving advice. What makes this even more complicated is if you see in this Venn diagram here, most, so about 80% of those SEC registered investment advisors are also registered as brokers. So then it becomes a little tricky to think about what standard they have to their clients. Um, when they're selling products like variable annuities or bonds in my examples, these SEC investment advisors that are also registered as brokers will be acting as brokers. So they're not gonna be held to a fiduciary standard when they're selling these types of products, but when they're giving advice to their consumer, perhaps in a wrap account or just more general financial advice, they would be held to a uh, fiduciary standard. So in general today, I'm gonna to just be talking about financial advisors or brokers who are not held to a fiduciary standard. And even those brokers that are all dual registered as an investment advisors, I'll be talking about them in their capacity when they're acting as brokers, so they don't have a fiduciary uh, duty. So I'm gonna give you an overview of three papers I have that examine the market for financial advice with a particular emphasis on the insurance industry. And what you'll see is uh, variable annuities, which are a popular insurance product, are one of the most commonly cited products uh, in consumer complaints. So I'm gonna talk about three projects. One is this paper, Brokers versus Retail Investors, Conflicting Interests and Dominated Products. And the reason I'm gonna talk about this paper is to just give you some clean evidence, and I think some of the cleanest evidence showing that we have these conflicts of interest, they play an important role, um, and we do see these dominated products persisting in the market. And then I'm gonna talk about the, sort of the main paper for the day, this paper on uh, conflicting interests and the effect of fiduciary duty, uh, looking at evidence from the variable annuity market. And lastly, if we have time, I'll talk a little bit about, I have a paper on uh, advisor misconduct more generally uh, beyond just sort of conflicts of interests. So let me dive into that first paper. So in that first paper, uh, where I'm gonna study the market for reverse convertible bonds. So you don't really need to be an expert on these bonds, but the idea is these are, it's a type of bond that is a bond plus a short, short put option that is sold to wealthy households or relatively wealthy households in the US. So these are purchased by households that typically have at least $200,000 in annual income and about a million dollars in investable assets they're typically short term, so about three months to two years, often one year, and they're issued by investment banks. So let me tell you how a, an example of how one works. So this is a reverse convertible bond that was issued by JP Morgan Chase, and the payoff of the bond is linked to Microsoft. So it's a little weird in the sense that JP Morgan Chase issued this bond, it's, they're raising funding for themselves. The payoff of the bond is linked to Microsoft, but Microsoft's actually not involved in this bond really whatsoever, other than the payoff is linked to the performance of Microsoft. And the way it works, as long as the price of Microsoft stock remains above $22 every day, investors are gonna receive a return of 11.25%, which is a really high return on a one-year bond when this was issued in uh, 2010. So they get a really high return as long as Microsoft does well, but if the price of Microsoft ever closes below $22, 
then the payoff of the bond is gonna be linked to the price of Microsoft at maturity. And what you can see here, I've drawn the payoff diagram. If Microsoft does poorly, investors could lose some or all of their money. So the reason I show this is not so much that reverse convertibles are that a particularly interesting market. It is about five, $10 billion in the US, so it is sizable. But the reason I'm gonna show you this a particular example is this isn't the only bond that JP Morgan issued on that date. So it turns out they issued an identical bond that paid a coupon of 9%. So it had a 2.25% lower return uh, and they issued on the same date. So you can see here, I've drawn the payoff diagram, even if you don't fully understand it, the key thing you should see is the red line is always below the blue line, which means if you buy the red bond, you're always gonna get a 2.25 percentage point lower return than the blue bond. And keep in mind the risk-free rate at this time is around 1%. So this is a this two and a quarter difference in returns is a huge difference. So it's weird is not only do people buy this 9%, the red bond here, but actually about 10 times as many consumers bought this dominated product as the superior product. So even if consumers were making mistakes, we'd still expect on average for them to buy the better product. Well, what's going on here? It turns out that if you look in the data, JP Morgan paid a, a, essentially a one percentage point higher kickback or commission to brokers for selling the inferior bond. So simply brokers were incentivized to sell the 9% bond in this example, which is why not only are consumers buying them, but they're actually buying a lot more of them. And this is not a unique example. I can find um, hundreds of examples like this in the data. So here I'm just plotting the distribution. This is, I've got some data on all these reverse convertibles. I'm plotting the distribution of the fair market value. What you're supposed to see here is just, there's a lot of dispersion um, where there's some reverse convertibles that effectively have like a 10 percentage point higher risk adjusted return than others. If you look at what people actually buy in the data, so here on the Y axis, I've got the size of the bond that was issued. On the X axis, I have the fair market value or how good that bond is for consumers. What you would have expected to see is, or you might expect a positive relationship that consumers like to buy better bonds. What you see here is the exact opposite. If anything, it looks like consumers are buying more of the worst bonds on average. So this should be a bit puzzling. And the reason or what's driving this is the behavior of brokers. So these are the fees or the kickbacks that brokers get paid by the issuers for selling these products. So the key thing about these brokers fees are consumers of the end customer doesn't pay these fees. It's a kickback that's paid from the issuer. So JP Morgan in that case to the broker for selling the product. Well, you can see they range from zero to 5%. So if you spend, if a consumer buys $100,000 worth of these bonds, their broker could make anywhere from zero to $5,000 for that particular transaction. And the key thing is these fees are big and they vary a lot across bonds. And if you look at what types of bonds investors or brokers are incentivized to sell, you see they're incentivized to sell the bonds with a lower fair market value. So on the Y axis here, I had the fair market value, which you could think of as like, how good is that bond for consumers? On the X axis, I have the broker's fees and what you can see is brokers earn a higher fee for selling products that are worse for consumers. Exactly like in that initial example I showed you. And then once you sort of control for these differences in fees, you do find this nice positive or the positive relationship you'd expect where consumers like to buy better bonds. So there's a positive relationship between sort of the quality of these bonds or the fair market value and issuance size. You find this relationship once I control for differences in fees. So the key thing I want to take away from that, uh, those initial sort of discussion is, you know, it's like, I think some of the cleanest evidence we have of what I would guess are relatively sophisticated consumers buying unambiguously dominated bonds. So remember, these are the wealthier uh, households that are purchasing these products. Uh, and if we see sort of their, some sense, you know, getting, uh, making mistakes, you can only worry about what's happening to the potentially less sophisticated households. Mark, can I just jump in for one quick sec? Yeah. Because what, then why are they why are they issuing the good bonds at all? Is it just like sort of a price discrimination story that you they, want? There's a few people are smart enough to figure this out, so we want to get them, but everybody else will just push the bad ones? Is that it? Exactly. So what happens in practice 
is you're going to sell the blue bond to your more sophisticated consumers who are maybe talking to more brokers, might be able to figure out like what is actually the what should be the market price of these bonds. And then you sell the red bond, the dominated product to your less sophisticated consumers. So JP Morgan is just basically offering a menu of products that are going to allow brokers to price discriminate across consumers. Um, so the surprising thing is the inferior bond typically has higher sales than the superior bond. So this can't just be driven by mistakes. Uh, and the reason is brokers are incentivized to sell these inferior bonds. So building on this, I want to look at the markets for variable annuities. Um, because the variable annuity, so I said $2 billion for reverse convertibles. The variable annuity market is roughly $2.2 trillion. So it's a huge source of retirement savings for individuals in the U.S. To give you a point of context, if you look at uh, like 401k savings in the U.S. is about $7 trillion. Um, so that's a primary source of retirement for households. $2 trillion is quite big. If you look in the data, it's actually one of the these variable annuities. So they're created by insurers are some of the most commonly cited products in consumer complaints. And part of the reason is brokers earn high commissions for selling these products. So on average, they earn 6% of the initial investment amount, but that commission ranges from zero to 16%. And keep in mind, this commission is paid from the insurer to the broker, and you can sort of think of it as a, a kickback. So it's gonna provide brokers strong incentives to sell some products over others, uh, and the incentives of these brokers may not align with investors. So what this is saying, uh, if a consumer buys is nearing retirement, they're going to buy maybe a hundred thousand dollar annuity. The broker for selling that product on day one could get paid anywhere from you know six thousand to upwards of fifteen thousand dollars for selling that product. So the insurer is going to pay the commission. The individual household or consumer is going to pay expenses, typically two percent of assets annually. Uh, that's going to go to the insurer for these products. So in some sense, these annual expenses are going to want to, what's going to fund uh, these high broker commissions. And in 2016, the Department of Labor issued their fiduciary rule, which never ended up being enforced, which would require brokers to act in their clients' best interests when selling retirement products. So to give you sort of a rough overview of how a variable annuity works, you can kind of think of it as a mix between a mutual fund uh, and a regular annuity. So the way it works is these are all created by insurers and they have an accumulation phase where a household will buy a variable annuity, maybe $100,000, and they will allocate that $100,000 into cross different sub accounts, which are basically mutual funds within that variable annuity. They'll pay annual expenses, and then there'll be a distribution phase. So after maybe 10, 15, 20 years, the variable annuity will start paying out money to the owner of that variable annuity until death or for a certain period of time. One nice feature about these products, at least from a consumer's perspective, is you can buy different types of guarantees. So you can get a guaranteed minimum return, which is I think in some sense why they're pretty, often can be a pretty easy sell to households, uh, which is something we'll try to control for our analysis. So the way it works is we have these variable annuity issuers. So Lincoln, Prudential, they're gonna sell the products of these variable annuities through financial advisors or brokers. So UBS, Wells Fargo, and Wells Fargo, UBS, et cetera, will sell them to households. The issuer, the insurer is gonna pay a commission or what I've been calling a kickback to the financial advisor. And the retail investor is gonna pay an annual expense to the issuer. So keep in mind this commission, consumers don't really care about it because it's gonna be paid by the issuer to the broker. Um, but we'll see in the data that, you know, high commission products, not surprisingly, are tend to be more expensive for consumers. So here I'm plotting the distribution of commissions for selling these products. So again, the median commission here is about 7%. So on a 100,000 variable annuity, on day one, your broker gets paid $7,000 for selling that product. So these commissions are remarkably high. So if you think about and look at, uh, according to SEC rules, 
retail consumers aren't allow allowed to pay a fee greater than 5%, except for um, like unusual circumstances, or that's generally the rule of thumb, which means it's almost impossible to have a product that pays a commission more than 5% because consumers can't pay a fee that's greater than 5%. So variable annuities are sort of structured in this uh, unique way that's gonna allow the insurers to pay commissions that's higher than 5%. For example, I used to work as a financial engineer um, on a bond desk. There would be no way to really issue a bond where we paid a commission of greater than 5% because of these SEC rules. The reason variable annuities are able to sort of get around this is because um, in the variable annuity case, you're gonna pay a commit an expense, consumers pay an expense ratio of maybe one to 2% a year, but they're locked into paying that one to 2% for maybe 10 to 15 years, depending on how the annuity is structured. So that's gonna allow insurers or uh, enable the insurers to pay uh, relatively high commissions uh, on these products. So then some sense, these high commissions in and of themselves are why it's in some sense a nice product for brokers to sell. This is the expense ratio or the distribution of expense ratios paid by consumers and it's a percentage of assets. So this is relatively high if you wanted to compare it to something like uh, ETF. So the average exchange traded fund in the US, the expense ratio is probably on the order of uh, 20 to 40 basis points. So these fees are much higher. And you know it may not seem like going from a fee of 3% per year to 1% is very much, but if you think about it, you're locked in this product for a long time you're gonna be paying these fees every year, it actually adds up to be quite a bit. So suppose that we had a household with $100,000 that bought a variable annuity where they paid a fee of 3% and we could talk them into buying the same variable annuity where they only had to pay an expense ratio or a fee of 1%. By just doing that, we would have effectively increased the value of their retirement savings by 40%. So rather than being able to buy a $100,000 variable annuity, just by getting them to get in these uh, from the 3% variable annuity to 1%, we've effectively increased their retirement savings by $40,000 just by getting them to buy the cheaper product. So if you think about, you know, this is $2.2 trillion in, uh, in the US, if you could get all variable annuity consumers to buy the less expensive products, this would have a huge impact and immediately increase sort of retirement savings for these people by like 10 to 20% easily. So this is the one regression table I will show uh, in the paper, or sorry, in my presentation today, but here, what I'm here I'm doing is regressing variable annuity sales on the expense ratio and commissions. And what you see is there's this negative coefficient on expenses, which suggests, uh, not surprisingly, consumers don't like to buy products with high expenses. Uh, conversely, if we see this big positive coefficient on commissions, which tells us that brokers like to sell high commission variable annuities. And what's useful is not, you know, not surprising we get this negative and positive sign, but it's useful to compare the, the magnitudes of these. So what this says is a one percentage point decrease in expenses is correlated with a 42% increase in sales. So um, it looks like households actually think are relatively sensitive to these expense ratios. Uh, and at the same time, we see a one percentage point increase in commissions is correlated with an 18% increase in sales. So it's not, you can't actually compare those coefficients or those uh, effects directly because expenses are annual. So if I increase or decrease expenses by 1%, that's gonna be 1% every year for the next 10 to 15 years, depending how long this product's outstanding, where commissions are a one-time payment. So if you really make this an apples to apples comparison, it says that sales are about four times as sensitive to brokers incentives as their investors. Or in other words, what this suggests is when a broker's selling products to his consumer or his clients, uh, he or she places about four times as much weight on their own financial incentives than their, health, their customers. So given these concerns about conflicts of interest, the Department of Labor issued the fiduciary rule, which was gonna require brokers to give prudent advice in the customer's best interests to mitigate these conflicts of interest uh, with potential consequences. So to give you a sense of the timeline for the rule, in 2015, o Obama announced the proposal. In response, brokers and insurers started preparing for this. In 2016, the Department of Labor issued the rule, 
with compliance required in 2017. So remember during this time, uh, Trump gets elected, which is sort of puts the rule in limbo. In 2017, at the last second, the rule is gonna take sort of partial effect, but have no enforcement. Uh, and then 2018, the rule is vacated by the Fifth uh, Circuit Court and the status is, was sort of in limbo. Um, and subsequent to 2018, several states sort of proposed their own version and the Department of Labor has often talked about sort of revisiting uh, the rule. So we're, we're gonna look at the paper is, did the announcement of this rule and issuance, did it impact the behavior of brokers and, and insurers and it, did it change the types of variable annuities that they sold? Um, so there's a lot of anecdotal evidence suggesting that these brokerage firms did respond uh, and the majority of insurers report making changes in their annual reports. So this is Voya talking about how they modified our sales and compensation practice in response to this. Uh, Egion complains that uh, due to the, they face lower demand following the implementation of the rule, but it wasn't actually bad for all insurers. So Lincoln Financial Group talks about because they were prepared for this rule, um, they actually saw an increase in variable annuity sales. So then again, another nice quote from MetLife. So one thing, the sort of tricky thing about this rule is it never was really enforced, but this is, I think a nice quote from MetLife talking about like, there was a lot of confusion about when the rule or if it finally went into effect, could there be some enforcement about in like the pre-period, there was just a lot, of, a lot of ambiguity, which I think is part of the reason you see a lot of insurers get ready for this and respond to it, even though the rule is ultimately never enforced. So you can see that investors responded to this. So here I've got data on all consumer complaints um, against their financial advisors in the US every year. And what you see is around this time, you see actually a pretty big spike in fiduciary related complaints, even though at this time, uh, their financial advisor was not held to fiduciary uh, duty. And you also see that it had a big impact on the composition of variable annuities sold. So here, the white dots correspond to low expense variable annuities. So those in the bottom quartile of expenses. So that would be good for consumers or households. And then the black, we have high expense variable annuities. Those are good, um, not good for consumers or less good for consumers. And what you see is around the time of the rule issuance, uh, when it was talked about a big decline or 52% decline in the sale of high expense annuities. So it's, it looks like the rule had a big impact on the more, more expensive products, brokers stop selling them, where it has no impact on the low expense annuities, which sort of makes sense. But Mark, you don't you don't show what? Um, can you just go back a second. Yeah. The uh, the good ones didn't go up, so people are just buying something else. Is what you're saying? Uh, you will see in general, a, some of it is a substitution to um, fixed index annuities, which are a little bit of a simpler product. Um, and about 5% of assets will leave the market. So you will see that the, some people stop selling variable annuities altogether, uh, as a result of the rule, I don't see exactly where those dollars go. So it's a little bit hard to say, like, if those were, we're not thinking about like the effectiveness of the rule, we might wor be worried if like that money that leaves the market as a result of this, that could be a bad thing. One thing I will say, sort of suggesting that I don't think it was just sort of this money leaving the market and going under the mattress, is you don't see that this rule differentially impacted big versus small accounts. So one argument against the fiduciary rule is that what it would do is it increases the cost of providing financial advice. And as a, as a result of that, as a broker, I'm not going to service lower income households anymore because it's just too expensive to service them. And what you see in the data, it doesn't look like there's a decline in sales or a differential effect um, for sort of smaller accounts versus larger accounts. So it doesn't look like that effect about sort of what the rule did is it changed the fixed cost of advice and people stopped getting advice. Uh, at least in this setting, it didn't really, that, that effect doesn't seem to be there. Here, I'm just plotting the average expense ratios. And what you see is there's a huge drop around the time the rules discussed and issued.
This is just a different way of seeing this. This is a heat map looking at the composition of variable annuities that were available for sale. So on the x-axis, I have expense ratios, commission rates on the y-axis. And what you see is this red uh, is an increase. And what you see is around the time of the rule, there's a big increase in the availability of low commission, low expense ratio variable annuities. So what happened in response to the rule is insurers changed the types of variable annuities they offered. What also is going on at the same time is not only does the, the slate of a variable annuities available for, for sale change, but also the types of variable annuities that brokers sold also changes. So you, what you can see is this sort of like the same figure. Here I'm gonna be sales weighting it. So this is gonna capture the behavior of not only insurers, but also brokers. And what you see is, you know, there's a, a big increase in the sale of these low commission, low expense ratio products. A different way of putting, seeing this, you can see this is the equal weighted uh, expense ratios for variable annuities um, around the time of the rule change. And what you see is there's this decline after the rule was issued, which is going to capture, again, the behavior of insurers. If we look at sales weighted, this captures the behavior of both brokers and insurers in response to the rule change. So to recap the main findings, we find that following the Department of Labor rule, sales became more sensitive to expense ratios. So it looks like between brokers and consumers, uh, they placed more weight on the expense ratios and avoided buying high fee products. And we also see at the same time an increased availability of low expense products. So it really is capturing both the behavior of brokers and insurers. In terms of the mechanism, we don't have a, a great way of teasing out. So it could be driven by two things. One is it could be a change in consumer awareness. The other is, well, maybe insurers were also worried about the threat of punishment. Certainly the anecdotal evidence suggests that insurers were partially worried about the threat of punishment. Um, one thing that would be kind of interesting would be to update this paper in a few years after it seems like the fiduciary rule uh, is not coming back and seeing if this effect is persisted or not. Because if it's persisted, maybe it's something about consumer awareness, if it didn't persist, that might tell us it's something about um, threat of punishment. In terms of other results, we find that a total variable annuity sales declined, partly offset by an increase of fixed income, fixed index annuities. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, it doesn't look like small accounts were differentially impacted. So it doesn't look like um, these concerns about brokers not servicing households, small households uh, was really present after the, the proposed rule change. Yeah, sorry, uh, Walter, you have a question? Walter, you may be muted. Yeah, I got out of here. That's right, Peter. Okay. I'll, I'll be trained in using this in another sorry, few years. It's fine. Uh, yeah, we can. I can hold the question to the end, Mark, if you want. Sorry, I had my. I dropped my headphones right when you asked this. So I didn't hear it, Walter. Would you mind? So, uh, no, and I had, didn't have my. I had it on mute. So I can hold this to the end. I just wondered whether you considered, uh, as you're looking at this, the the changes in some of the state laws, which are requiring a suitability and best interest, New York, for one, maybe not as strong as the uh, DOL rule would have been, but New York and then the NEIC moving in that direction as well. Um, that is a great suggestion. At the time, I did, I have looked at um, New York in particular, because they also had a rule change where you had to report commissions or it was easier for consumers to get commissions they don't so, know so, you're, you're, so it's just another regulator that is bringing some reaction by to by the insurance companies to see where things are going maybe they were more worried about uh dol but also there are changes from the naic and new york state which is a big influence on the regulatory framework yeah that is a a great suggestion i have not looked at it explicitly there was a uh finance a job market candidate last year from London Business School who looked at sort of a follow on paper to ours where he did find some differences based on what was going on in New York State, but I don't remember the exact details. Uh, his name is Alex Barbu. I think he got a job at INSEAD, but uh, he looked specifically at New York and I remember him finding effects, but I don't remember the exact details. And, and the, one, the one other question would be that as you look at 2017, 2018, the reduction in tax rates uh, a lot of annuities, variable annuities, were sold with, well, on the strength of the tax benefits. And I think 
I haven't looked at, I'm not an economist, but looking at what happened, lower rates on dividend tax, lower rates on capital gains has made the, I think the trade off from uh, for the tax benefits coming from a variable annuity less valuable than they were before. That's a great point. And that could be part of the reason you see a decline in variable annuity sales. What we're really focused on is more the composition of variable annuities that get sold. But I think that's a, a point well taken. It actually might be a way of um, thinking about why the market shrunk as a whole around this time. It, part of it could be the rule, but also you're right that it could be driven by these tax changes. It, this, but I, but I, I see your point, though, on the, on the commissions and on the expenses. And, of course, the insurance industry doesn't love the phrase kickbacks, but I'm glad your slide show it as commissions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, um careful to call it commissions. I call it kickbacks. So I think some people from outside this industry, it make like uh, my work, wife works in medicine. If I call it a kickback, I think she will understand like at least the economics of it a little bit better than. Uh... It's, it certainly catches their attention. <laughs> oh, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, in the last uh, few minutes here, I want to talk about another project I have just talking about more misconduct in general. So not just these conflicts of interest, but also things like uh, fraud and forgery that's going on. So I have another paper where we look at, well, how widespread is and persistent is misconduct in the financial advisory industry. Um, we observe the universe of financial advisors or brokers in the US. And what we find is roughly one in 13 advisors have a past record of misconduct. And when I say misconduct, you should think things like regulatory offenses, uh, criminal offenses, cases where advisors were fired for cause, or any sort of customer dispute that resulted in a settlement. This just plots um, the types of disclosures that you show in the data. So one nice thing in the data is we see uh, all customer disputes, uh, not only those that uh, resulted in some sort of settlement, same with like criminal investigations we'd see, we see all of them, not just ones that resulted uh, where there's uh, some sort of conviction. So you can see here 7% of financial advisors have a misconduct related disclosure on their record. And misconduct isn't frivolous. So here I'm plotting the distribution of damages. Granted, the median is uh, 40,000 and the mean is in excess of $100,000. So these are significant things. Um, the cost associated with misconduct is quite substantial. Here's just looking at the products. So what you see is in some of these complaints, they mention what product was involved, not always, all, always the case. And what you see is of the time when they mention the product, actually insurance are these really variable annuities are the most commonly product cited, which is sort of consistent with what I showed you earlier, given the commissions and fees that are involved. The other thing you see is misconduct is persistent. So past misconduct is highly predictive of future misconduct. So here I'm just plotting the share of advisors that have one, two, three, four, five, six misconduct offenses. And what you see is basically that right tail is too fat to suggest that misconduct is random. And what you see in the data is there's just, you have a lot of uh, serial offenders. It varies a lot across firms. So here I'm plotting the misconduct rate for the 10 best firms and the 10 worst firms in terms of the highest and lowest rates. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, Oppenheimer, roughly one in five of their advisors has a past record of misconduct. This is actually a pretty conservative estimate where it's probably closer to one in three, uh, where there's other firms, like I mentioned USA advisors at the beginning where uh, very few of their advisors have a record of misconduct. One kind of nice thing about this is when their paper came out, Oppenheimer, they didn't have to, but actually admitted to it that they knew this was a problem. Uh, and after a paper came out, they said that they've made significant investments to proactively tackle this risk and compliance issue uh, to our in our private client division. So I think just gives more credence that you know it was a problem there, uh, and they recognized it. As I mentioned, it also varies a lot geographically. So in areas um, like Palm Beach, Florida, especially the Sun Belt, where you have more retirees, you see higher rates of misconduct. And then there's other areas where it's uh, one in 50 advisors has a past record of misconduct. So the key thing, punchline is misconduct is common and widespread. There's a large share of repeat offenders and large and persistent differences across firms. In the paper, we also look at punishment. So you see there's a lot of repeat offenders, which suggests that, you know, the discipline may be absent from this market. The way it works is actually there's strict discipline within firms. So if you engage in misconduct, there's a 50-50 chance you're fired by your firm. 
Uh, but what happens is you typically just move across the street and work for a firm that is less strict. So basically you, you work for um, one of the cleaner firms, you engage in misconduct, you move to a firm like Oppenheimer. So what happens is even though firms are relatively strict, the labor market as a whole or competing firms sort of undoes this discipline. So to conclude for the talk, uh, we find that you know through these papers that conflicts of interest are present in the financial advisor industry, and they really play a first order role in driving investment decisions and are often substantially more important than the incentives of households uh, in the sense that advisors are often incentivized to sell these dominated products. And this is particularly problematic in the insurance industry. So I used to work in the securities industry and I sort of, if I had to think of like one product based on my research and my professional experience where conflict of interest were the biggest, I would say the variable annuity market and the insurance market in general, where you can get paid really high commissions for selling some products over others. Uh, we find evidence that the Department of Labor fiduciary rule uh, led to a decline in high expense variable annuity sales um, as sales became more expensive to expenses. And then lastly, we find that even sort of outside of conflicts of interest, advisor misconduct in general is quite prevalent in certain counties and firms. So thank you very much. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I will take questions and if no one's on the queue yet, which it looks like I will maybe ask the first one. So it seems like insurance is a classic credence good where the buyers, even after they've bought it, don't necessarily know whether the product is good or not. Um, it's interesting they say there's lots of complaints, but it's not quite clear what people are complaining about. Are they complaining about the high expense ratios, which seems like, well, they should have known that beforehand. It's really something else. So I'm just wondering, like, what what kind of incentives you, if you were omniscient social planner or lots of hands up, great. Uh, if you're the omniscient social planner or emperor of the universe or whatever, and you could structure these things any way you wanted to, it seems like fiduciary maybe doesn't even get you far enough. You need to do something more. And I was wondering, like, I just have a few crazy ideas. Like maybe could you use some kind of uh, like AI to figure out like what's the best What's the best match that doesn't, it's, it's not provided by an insurance company. It's not provided by the seller. So it doesn't have any reason to direct you towards certain kinds of other th uh, products that are more profitable. It just tries to figure out like really what is the best product for you. Um, is there, is there more information that consumers could actually use? Cause it seems like that's probably just, they are, they already have a lot of information and they can't process what they have. So any thoughts about that? Um, that is a great point. And I think that in some sense it is like, uh, calling it, it is like the, in some sense, the ultimate credence good, where if you think about it, if I got advice or was trying to evaluate my financial advisor and just looked at my returns data, I would probably die before I would have enough statistical power to actually try to rule out if it was a good or bad financial advisor based on returns at all, alone, just because stock returns are too noisy, like and asset returns are too noisy. So I think that is a, a great point. I was actually a bit surprised about how effective the department of labor or fiduciary rule was in terms of lowering expenses. Like I think going from high or seeing a 52% decline in high variable annuity expenses was quite large, which suggests it did have some bite. Um, but yeah, in general, it's a, these are tough problems. And I think you're right in that. So I showed her, I think my evidence early on that like the fiduciary rule did have an impact, but that's not gonna have any impact on advisor misconduct. Those are things, uh, they're not held to a fiduciary standard and you still see a lot of advisor misconduct. So I think holding them necessarily to a higher standard is not gonna solve those issues. For example, if you look at misconduct among investment advisor representatives that are held to a fiduciary standard versus brokers, you don't see a big difference in rates. So I think it's sort of two separate issues like the fiduciary rule could have a big impact on expense ratios, which would be good. But then there's this other separate issue of advisor misconduct. And actually, I think the fiduciary rule is going to have no impact on that. Like if they're, you're already holding them to a lower standard and they're violating that, holding them to a higher standard, it's not obvious that that's going to do anything on the misconduct front. All right. So I have on the queue uh, Andrea and Tom Baker and then Walter Welsh. Hello, thanks for being here. Um, you had mentioned during your presentation um, a bit that the, perhaps the release of the rule and the subsequent decrease in sales of the, I think it was the high 
variable annuities or something like that um had might might have been because of consumer awareness of you know the re the release of the rule and just you know like people being more cautious about what they're buying um maybe it didn't make brokers more careful after all i don't know um but i just wanted to know more if you had um any thoughts um about this whether the decline resulted because people started thinking twice um so do you have any insight past what you had mentioned briefly in the presentation it is tricky and the reason is like sort of it was so tricky is because what happens is like you have a big spike in consumer awareness around the announcement of the rule but then the rule is in limbo so it's not like it exactly went away and what you can see in the data sort of is like there's this big increase in consumer complaints that persists through 2020 and you do see like the effect I showed about the fiduciary rule on changing the sales of these high expense products actually does start to decline later in our sample, but it's a little tough to say because we don't have a ton of statistical precision to say, did it actually decline and go back to where it was? So I can't exactly tease it out. Uh, in some sense, from a research perspective, it would have been sort of nice had Trump gotten elected in 2020, because then the rule, people would have known that the rule wasn't coming back where when Biden comes back, was elected, I think that actually restarted this like sort of ambiguity of whether or not the rule is going to come back. Uh, which makes it hard from a research perspective. Okay, thanks so much. Yes, you always like people that introduce lots of variants if you're an econometrician, so <laughs> yeah. like, change everything. To, anyway, uh, the world may go to hell, but that's a separate matter. All right, Tom Baker's next, and then Walter Welsh. So, how much of this is really a market structure problem in the sense that, you know, A, it's a credence, credence good, P, B, People aren't willing to pay directly for the advice that you need to pay for. I mean, because if, if you know, think about it. If it's a credence good, you need by definition you need somebody to tell you whether yeah. it's good or bad. And 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 people aren't willing to pay for the advice that they need to get that. Um, and you know, so is one idea that you just sort of uh, prohibit commissions. Full stop. Uh, you know, it's, this isn't like the story about life insurance is that life insurance is sold, not bought. So you need high power commissions or people aren't going to buy it. You know, yep. and that's certainly and that's the failure of savings bank life insurance in the early 20th century. And but these don't seem to me to be in that category. These are people who know they need to know, save for, for retirement. And if they don't buy one thing, they're going to buy another thing. So it's not like you're, you know, it, these are. And so do you, do you just prohibit commissions? Um, and and then. You know, of course, then there's a, you know, then the brokers are, is a, is a credence good and our brokers going to com compete on the fact that they're, you know, good looking and, you know, good talkers rather than being good returns. Cause in the end, you can't really re measure the quality of a broker. I mean, like, what's the solution here? I mean, maybe, yeah. Yeah, you know, be, right. I think that is a great point. I don't have like a great answer. I can tell you that what the trade-offs are in some sense, the, the worry of like, if you have fixed commissions or, or basically no commissions, it, you get paid like a flat fee or something like that is, well, then maybe broker stop service seeing lower income households. We don't find a ton of evidence that are really any evidence that in our paper. Um, but that would be your main concern is, well, maybe they don't put in the same amount of effort. Um, one nice thing is like a, a good example, I think on this would be something like a, the proliferation of ETFs are actually kind of a nice market response to this in the sense that like they're low fee products where brokers don't have differential incentives for selling those. So there's no commissions in those products. So that's in some sense, a nice private market response to get around this issue where you used to have in mutual funds, brokers were incentivized to sell some over the others. If you look at ETFs that kind of eliminated uh, that. Okay, uh, Walter, you're next. Sorry, Walter, uh, it looks like you're on mute. You're on mute. I'll have to work on my sign language and it'll be better, you know? Uh, so that one of the thing is with the uh, uh, complaints had to do with high surrender charges. And that's where people weren't looking so much at fees on the annuity, but they were seeing that when they went to surrender, uh, they couldn't get their contract back without paying a 10 or 12 percent surrender charge couldn't get their money back and i think that that was that has caused complaints 
especially if the broker took or the agent, the advisor took too much of their assets and put it into one contract, which was subject to the surrender charge. It, uh, uh, an advisor who's following suitability standards wouldn't, wouldn't do that. So that that's one thing. I think uh, the thing is, um, maybe this, just, this is just another comment, the tax rates are what drove the annuity business for so long is that a broker or advisor could say, if you put some of your money into this deferred annuity, you'll come out ahead because you won't be paying taxes. And he was, you could say, is that, was that advice worthwhile? Should the customer have known that Other, otherwise? I'm not sure, but those higher tax rates were a real driver for people to buy, put some of their money in a deferred annuity. That economic uh, equation has changed over the years because tax rates have come down. Uh, so that is a good point about surrender chargers. I could check that. They don't always provide that much detail in the complaint, but that would be interesting to check. One thing you see in general is you see a spike in complaints and actually just sort of all sites of misconduct shows up after whenever the market goes down. I think just because people look at their statements more closely. So you actually don't see a big increase in sort of frivolous complaints uh, after market increase. You also see a big increase of like true complaints or things that have validity, I think, as people check their statements more closely. But I'll check that surrender charges thing. That's a good yeah, point. And, and I think what you said about the market going down, I think that's what brokers were worried about, that phrase best interest, that they won't hear about best interest until the market goes down. Um, yeah, potentially. And I think that the point about surrender charges is also kind of interesting because that's how they're able, the reason, part of the reason those exist is because these insurers are yeah. going to pay these huge commissions up front Exactly. If the consumer gets out of them too quickly, then they're not going to actually recoup all these that, benefits. So that's, that's why that, that's that. that's the system. Thank you. Yeah, and I think um, yeah, the fact that these are sort of structured in such a unique way to pay high commissions relative to virtually any other SEC registered security is part of the reason they're a popular retail product. And it's a good point about tax rates. I know Jim Paterba has like some nice papers showing that actually once you account for these fee differences. Uh, it's not even with high tax rates. It wasn't clear whether or not you necessarily came ahead, but um, yeah, it's a it, great point. So, and one other thing on the DOL regulation, the way the court decided it, it might be hard for any Department of Labor to, to go back to that unless they get a change in legislation. And that's a tough thing to do uh, to get compromise on, on something like uh, pension reform or uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm basically on pension legislation, but that's, I think, what they're going to need if they want to go back to it. That's a great point. Next on the queue is Travis. All right, uh, thanks. So I, the the world of, of uh, brokers is kind of a mystery to me still. So forgive me if this is a, uh, a silly question, but the, the little that I do know com comes from um, the fully insured health insurance market, you know, like the policies that are sold to employers. Yep. Um, and my understanding is that, you know, if you're an employer and you're trying to find a health insurance, uh, for, for your employees, you can go and talk to people and you might not know whether they're a broker or an agent. Uh, and there's just kind of real ambiguity in the market as to, as to the, the, the sort of legal status of the folk of the person who, who might be helping you find your policy. But my understanding is that brokers have a fiduciary duty to their clients and agents don't. And so I wonder whether that might be an interesting, I mean, anyway, thoughts on that, or like, is there an interesting sort of research paper there and, in a similar vein? By agent, are you, does agent mean like I, I work for the insurer and brokers? I'm I'm a third like party? you work for the insurer, but you can work for multiple insurers such that like functionally you are kind of making a market and providing quotes to your client in a similar way to a broker, I think. And, and. And you might, you know, and, and, and the, the folks that are going to brokers and agents often don't know either conceptually or as just a factual matter, the, the status of the person they're working with. That is a nice, good point. Um, one thing sort of related we look in the paper is like, um, one thing you, you hear often is actually you want to talk to an talk you'll hear people say you talk you should talk to like an independent broker because then they don't are incentivized to sell you like certain branded products over others or certain branded insurance products over others we actually find some evidence that if you wanted to buy variable annuities you actually want to go directly to the company because they tend to they're more likely to sell you a lower fee product and i think part of the reason that is um 
they they're gonna feel a little bit more responsible if they sell you an expensive product because it's they can't really blame like if i'm a broker and i sell you a bad product from a third party i can always blame it on that third party for like designing a terrible product where i think in some sense when you work for the company it's a little bit harder to or you may internalize the potential cost of selling uh expensive products a little bit differently Or can I ask you about the last part of your talk where, I mean, it seems shocking that you can lose your job as a broker for basically, you know, screwing over your clients and then walk across the street as you describe it and go work for somebody else. And is is there, should we have enhanced liability for firms that fail to check their employees carefully enough? Or should we have, um, you know, uh, a mandatory bar from the industry for a few years if you've been fired or like it seems like we ought, we ought to be able to move on that margin a little bit it doesn't solve the high expense problem obviously as you said but isn't there more we could do to j jazz up the incentives there yes so like one thing um it is pretty hard to get barred it happens but it's pretty rare um one thing I know like Massachusetts after our paper came out has done now is they look at at the firm level if you're higher than a certain threshold, you get increased regulatory scrutiny, um, which we've, I've done some preliminary analysis that does seem to have a little bit of an effect. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a, a great point. And it's a little puzzling here because like it's a advisor, the advisors industry is a little unique in that it's like one case where having your employees engage in misconduct actually could be quite profitable for the firm, which is why you see them these sort of uh, recidivist advisors just recycled across different firms. I think we have time for one more. Travis, did you have your hand up? Or so, not? I mean, this is a this might take us a little bit far afield, but um, I mean, my understanding is that th this type of an incentive or conflict of interest exists in multiple you know settings. This is just a nice one, a measurable one, but that that doctors face a similar conflict of interest in the sense that. Often they'll be incentivized to provide care that makes them money, rather than care that the, that their employee that their that their patient needs. So you know you you the, the the famous studies of doctors that do too many C sections and stuff and 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 get a financial benefit as a result. You know doctors are fiduciaries classically. Yeah. And so uh, I mean that's my understanding anyway. And so I guess the question is like is is making is making the the party with the conflict of interest a fiduciary enough uh or or are there you know how would you deal with the situations where this seems to persist as a problem and yet the conflict of interest is is structured through it through a fiduciary uh, relationship what is slightly like i think what is sort of telling between the the advisory setting versus the doctor setting and like, I don't have great data on conflicts of interest in the medical setting, but suppose I just looked at like medical malpractice as a measure. If you look at the baseline rates of advisor misconduct and medical malpractice, they don't look that different. They're higher in the advisory industry, but the big distinction is in the advisory industry, it is concentrated among a small set of advisors that are continuously engage in misconduct. Where if you look at doctors, it's much more randomly distributed among who has a medical malpractice case. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think my understanding of the problem is that like the the, the issue often doesn't a, a, arise to the level of malpractice. It's, you know, that the person will get a C-section, yeah. didn't need it, it's fine in the end. Or even if it was, if even if it you know had some kind of complication, it'll be difficult to sue for malpractice. And so you sort of need some other more sensitive metric of whether the doctor is acting actually in the interest of the patient or not than, than a malpractice claim. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And then there's been like changes in Sunshine Laws where you can get some of this data and be interesting to know, like, in response to that, uh, do you see effects? And you could actually, there would be scope, I think, actually to do like hospitals have changed their policies on this and maybe get some data on that to see like when a hospital changes its policy on consulting relationships or something like that, or like where it changes the conflicts of interest, do you see an impact on patient outcomes or something like that? Yes, and well, Travis has a backstory, which I won't uh, force him to talk about now, but if you're interested, he can talk more about that. Uh, I guess it's five o'clock, so um, please join me in thanking Mark for coming and for all that interesting information and stuff. Uh,
That was wonderful. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was uh, fun to be here. Okay, cool. See you soon. Bye. Bye, everybody.